वेलकम बैक टू द थिंकर्स कॉर्नर एवरीवन टुडे वी इम्बार्क ऑन अ कैप्टिवेटिंग जर्नी अक्रॉस एकेडमिया एक्टिविज्म एंड म्यूजिक विद अ ट्रूली रिमार्केबल गेस्ट सुमित समोस ही इज एन इंडियन एंटिका स्कॉलर एंड रैपर फ्रॉम बोर्न इनटू अ दलित क्रिश्चियन फैमिली इन तेंदुली पाडार विलेज कोरापुर डिस्ट्रिक्ट ओडिशा सुमित्स अ ब्रिंगिंग लेट द फाउंडेशन फॉर ए यूनिक परस्पेक्टिव ऑन सोशल इश्यूज कंप्लीटिंग हिज स्कूलिंग इन भुवनेश्वर He went on to pursue a master's in Latin American literature Spanish at Jawaharlal Nehru University Delhi. Here he became an integral part of the Birsa Ambedkar Phule Students Association, a platform for social justice and anti-caste advocacy. In 2022 uh, Sumit added another feather to his academic cap by completing the MSc's uh, program in Modern Asian Studies at the prestigious University of Oxford. his experiences there particularly in navigating the complexities of caste led him to share his insights in a thought provoking piece for the round table of india uh, the culmination of his experiences and reflection resulted in the publication of his memoir affairs of caste a young diary released in july 2022 under panthers for publication but sumit Samos is not just an academic he is also a force in the magnificent genre of anti-caste music in 2018 he unveiled his first hip hop single ladai seekh le learn to resist showcasing his prowess as a rapper drawing inspiration from the legendary Tupac Shakur Sumit uses his art to amplify the voices of the oppressed and challenges the existing social order So today we have the privilege of delving into the mind of this multifaceted individual. So join me as I sit down with Sumi Samos on the Thinkers Corner to explore his journey, his music, and the intersectionality of his activism. So welcome, Sumi. How are you? I am good. Thank you, Neeraj, for inviting me to discuss on various things that you told me. Yeah, definitely. So. we'll start our discussion with the very basic question that uh, as you have were born into a dalit christian family in odisha so can you tell us more about your early life and how it shaped your views on caste and particularly the politics surrounding social justice uh so yes i grew up in a village in south odisha and the name of my village is called tenthli pada my parents are first generation converts my parents uh, were the first people in my block to convert to christianity uh, their conversion to christianity was not based just uh, to you know get out of caste system or to you know get benefits from some missionaries it was never that which many people believe even today uh, but their uh, their conversion to christianity was due to their reading of some pamphlets and leaflets and they started reading the bible and they started started having a new world view about life and about the society about you know the purpose of their life and the meaning of life and many questions you know so that's how they converted to christianity and um, but on the other hand i also you know was born to a dom family and uh, i could not avoid that right uh, so most of my i mean i would go and play with children from uh, the dom caste whether they were christian converts or no non christians uh i would eat with them i would sit with them we looked the similar but on sundays and other days whenever the dom christian people gathered it would be only the convert people not the dom people who were non christians right and so for a very long time i uh lived uh with a very confident identity while childhood because my parents would say that we are not uh, we don't have any caste we are just christians you know we are god's children and i always believed that because uh, we are only dom people who are converted to christianity i didn't have any idea but gradually as i grew up i also realized that i am also a dom uh, like when i go to schools or when i when we go to you know when we cross our streets we realize that we still cannot enter some of the houses of even opc people right and then i started to think myself about who i was am i a christian or am i a dom and then i realized i think i have both these identities right and uh, that's how i grew up i went to i went far uh, to a far off town to do my schooling and then i did my college in bhubneswar uh, so during all those years of my life i encountered a lot of upper caste students who were very proudly upper caste who were very proudly brahmins so in front of them what would you tell 
you know and in a place like orissa being christian means either adivasi or dalit so they know that you are a dalit by looking at your face by the way you speak by the way you dress yourself right so that was the journey uh, but i did not have a intellectual understanding of what caste system was or you know the dalits in other parts of india i had no clue about all that uh, i was very ashamed after a point of time to say that i am sc because in the classroom and in the college maybe one or two students only were sc we were very scared you know how people will react to us how people will uh, humiliate us later so i was very afraid of those things um that was my growing up period but the good thing was the dalits the domes in my place and even other dalit communities every militant okay they will not take back any discrimination if you try to look down on them they will they will talk back to you they will get back to you mm. okay so that was also one thing that i always grew up with my life was very colorful you know full of dance and songs and music and you know dom people will just walk around everywhere in the korapur district you know with no fear and all the upper caste people who have come from other parts of odisha they are scared of dom people they feel that dom people are criminals you know they can any time mess mess up with you so i also grew up with you know it is like a very mixed experience mm-hmm. like at times you feel like wow like you are so proud of your identity like you know you can beat anybody up you know your people are very militant but at times when you go to school and college and you are only with upper caste people you feel like wow i'm also from an inferior caste mm-hmm. so that was my uh, basic you know life journey and it was very fun i grew up watching imran hasmi's movies listening to kumar sanu songs in the night ehme himes resmeya and you know uh, mohammad rafi kishor kumar telugu movies chiranjeevi and nagarjun so very mass you know my life was very mass mass mm-hmm. life but also it was a very you know romantic life i used to listen to kk songs songs from gajni movies and we were getting very excited you know uh, but in home my home was very disciplined because they were christian family so you have to sleep on time wake up on time you have to be very clean and neat you have to be very disciplined you have to be very hard working so yes basically that that's my life so yeah indeed like yeah, indeed. your life and uh, particularly your identity uh, that you have you know that always struggle to you know find your actual identity but then you realize that you belong to here and there you always belong to you don't know so many places like you talk about that how the music and uh, this uh, you know that celebratory life around you has uh, helped you in a many ways that particularly and then you you know that found your voice into rap so so my question is to like how and what drew basically you into this hip hop music and how did you basically discover rappers like uh, tupac sakur which become your also inspiration so yes while growing up um, i mean i was always used to seeing my own communities uh, you know music they play drums they dance and sing and in uh, every occasion be it a wedding be it a funeral Uh, and on even someone's birthday or festivals you know people will always dance and sing so that is like a part of our life always i grew up like that i had no, i had never listened to rap songs in my growing up years only when i came to delhi i listened to um, you know nas biggie tupac and uh, 50 cent and you know eminem uh, dr dre and all these things you know all these people ice cube i started listening to them but of course there is also uh the music that they produce also comes from a different context you know it's coming from an american context which is not my context although i could relate to it um i could re- i couldn't relate to the context but i could relate to you know the 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 music genre of it mm-hmm. and so i dis- and then i was also getting into activism i was slow gradually becoming part of babsa i had not fully become part of babsa but i was gradually becoming part of babsa because i was newly reading things i was newly re- talking to people senior people from babsa ambedkarites mostly and so i realized that you know just writing on facebook and uh, sharing it on instagram is not going to reach out to more people and so i need to maybe try out this rap music because i also come from a background where there is some sort of music and that's how i ended up you know rapping and uh, of course it's also difficult because you know english is not my mother tongue uh, and hindi is not my mother tongue and i have to rap in it only then people will listen to it and oriya is also not my mother tongue you know i grew my language is desia which is very different from oriya yeah. so there are also difficulties in terms of uh, you know language 
because rap is like you know you have to also speak your mind you have to speak your heart heart out right and you it needs local slangs and the uh, the flavor of where you come from all of that and uh, so yeah it was difficult initially but i tried my best uh, for few years i rapped in english and hindi because i realized that you know i have to do it for social justice i have to do it for the antipas movement uh, so i'll do my best and i did and then after point of time i stopped <laughs> yeah basically also you yeah, i have observed that you particularly your lyrics Uh, the themes of your lyrics also you know the tackle around the caste oppression the discrimination and also along with also uh, you know that hope a uh, resistance and so how do you balance your role as an artist and you also talk about that how uh, you started engaging in activism in uh, genu so how do you balance the your role as an artist and also as an activist in in your music particularly um i think you know everyone whether they are an artist or activist or student i think they grow in life over a period of time so you are not the same every single time maybe initially when i was you know maybe 2016 and 17 when i was very new uh, then you are very charged emotionally you are very charged so you want to be very angry and your music also speaks like that uh, right and you are also doing activism you are very excited passionate then gradually over a period of time you also realize you become a little bit calm down you know uh you start to take some steps back and then like that's how research came to my life i felt that i need to read more i need to engage more so that i can contribute something to one area of my interest and uh i i still have that you know feeling of uh, you know feeling of you know anger but anger not in a sense of being consumed by anger but you know for right cause i still have that uh, maybe i'm not writing anymore because you know it creativity is like that you know uh, it comes once in a while mm. and then you don't have it so maybe maybe after 2 3 months if i play some youtube beats on my speaker and i start rapping i might have new I lines mm-hmm. right uh, so but yes i still believe um, art and you know activism can go together not art and activism even art and uh, sorry activism and academics also can go together regardless of wherever we go you know we go to oxford you go to nottingham you go to harvard the thing is we cannot avoid our people you know we have to come back to our people yes you know you have to come back to your people you have to be part of their lives and what does that mean that means you have to do some kind of activism mm-hmm. right you are you are the only one from their community who who has gone out so if you don't speak for them who is going to speak for them who is going to write for them so activism and all also is you know it's very cool thing for many upper caste people it's just like okay we are in university we'll do it for a little time after that our career our money our husband and wife marriage family but for us it's not like that right yeah so yes yeah so basically also you have pointedly you know that pointed out rightly that upper caste is a you know that a matter of choice that whether they want to just for a you know that mm, part of fun and entertainment they just involve in the activism but for us like we can't choose we don't have option it's our responsibility and maybe it's uh, because of our roots and because of our struggles by the ancestors that we feel that wherever we are like in whatever capacity and position uh, we you know that always you know that trying to con- uh, contribute in some way and uh, as you also talk about that how your uh, journey from you know that odisha to particularly oxford and you wrote a beautiful piece uh, about this hypocrisy of the academia and the apocas uh, this uh, academic world into your uh, piece uh, so i just want to know that uh, that in your in that piece particularly you have talk about how the caste discrimination in academic institution such as university of oxford and uh, and how it works and what you know the strategies can be employed both to address and also to you know the broaden the discourse uh, on caste to make it more inclusive and accessible to a global audience including uh, like those outside in india so how we can you know that develop this approach and so on uh, so yes i think there are two parts to this question the first question is how do we address caste discrimination and you know questions of caste in a space like oxford mm-hmm. uh, to be honest who gets to go to oxford from india it's mostly you know upper caste students who have studied in few colleges like st stephens ashoka university um and these are the people you know who get to go to oxford right yeah. the rich elite upper caste 
and they have uh, they have agencies for them who will write their sop who will make their cv and while they are studying their undergraduate they are you know they are doing multiple internships you know they are working for the hindu they are you know working for some media they are doing some internship in jharkhand right and all of that they know how to present it they know how to present and by the end of ba third year they know exactly where they want to go yeah right and that's how scholarships are given right that's how university offers are given how do our what do our students do our students after class 12 if they go to ba they'll they'll only think of how to pass ba you know how to pass ma they don't have any clue we don't have any history past history past legacy who you know who will guide us and help us you know uh, to do these things so that's where we lag behind these people it's not like they have great ideas and knowledge but um the system is such that these are the people and these they will get in right so this is this needs to be addressed in a very systematic way right uh, from the level of college from the level of universities where we study let's say i'm studying in a college in delhi so maybe there should be some sort of you know support system in this college or university which will help me get internships which will help me write my cv which will prepare me to as applying abroad right only then we can go the other thing is academia you know even western academia what do they look for you know if you uh, they have some favorite topic hindu nationalism sustainability development and all these things right and these people write what these people write and cite authors and writers who are already popular in these academic circles mm. which we are not used to so these are the people who will get in right these people know how to bluff how to write in good english okay uh, the same thing that we might speak they might write in a very good english and they get in okay that's a that's a first step mm. second step when mm. once you go to space like oxford what happens is see it's not like caste people are not doing research on caste there's a difference in dalit people doing research on caste upper caste people doing research on caste upper caste people doing research on caste is just a professional experience dalit people doing research on caste is both a professional experience as well as a personal experience and because our personal experience is very much related to our professional experience when we go there we also want to let's say get scholarships for the students okay or let's say we want to put caste as a protected category right and the moment we start speaking these things then those people get offended right these people are like wow because you are now to- coming and talking about caste upper caste lower caste all these things so we are the people here we are also getting blamed mm-hmm. because in oxford and in cambridge we are people of color we are brown people we are the south asian people okay which are very nice and very sweet desi people it's very mm-hmm. nice to hear right but the moment if i go and say they look no you are upper caste you are like you know you come from a oppressive class and you practice discrimination against us they don't want to hear that right so it then the conflict starts yes. and this conflict is going to be there as long as you know we raise this questions so how do i address is like of course there is going to be conflict okay i need to prepare my mindset that okay even if there is conflict i will speak okay i will do my academics but also at the same time i need to have my mental health in in intact you know i need to also enjoy i need to travel i am in oxford i am in cambridge or i am in uk i need to travel i need to have good food i need to attend concerts i need to explore the world why because our parents our ancestors have never gotten into and what caste does caste deprives us of all this happiness all this pleasure all this enjoyment so that is also anti caste mm-hmm. you know So all these things, I think, goes together, and maybe that's what I've come to learn so far. So yeah, adding to the question, I as like I have read your memoir, and also you know that you have uh, for the audience. I want you to to you know that talk about this because your memoir highlights your journey from a remote Odisha village to Oxford, and uh, there are so many things that you have you know that elaborated on your in your memoir. So. can you describe the challenges you particularly faced navigating caste hierarchy in education and how did you overcome although you have talked about while talking about the office. can you elaborate on more yeah. yes uh, so i think it's uh, you know the way we understand navigating caste um, from from a small village in orissa to oxford there are different phases in between that when when i was studying in 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 the school 
in my village uh, most of most of the students were from dalit and adivasi backgrounds so there was not much an issue of caste except maybe two or three students who upper caste students uh, or one or two obc students who would not really you know spend close time with us or let's say we cannot go uh, enter their houses or you know we cannot play longer for, with them you know s- things like that then i that was my you know primary school days so that was not much an issue then i ended up uh, going to a boarding school outside there uh, there were more more upper caste students and less dalit and adivasi students so now what the problem was that these upper caste students would always take pride uh, in their caste you know because the surname that they have you know they look different they spoke differently so they would look down and pass comments on us you know by uh, by using our surnames so surnames making fun of your surname is also making fun of your caste uh, so this is what many of them would do but very subtly very subtly they still do it okay it's not like direct harassment but we we would feel very bad you know uh, when uh, these things happen even teachers would very in subtle ways they would pass these remarks and comments and you don't feel good about it when i came to college and in college i think this was this aggravated because i i was studying doing my college in bhubneswar and bhubneswar is a very caste space you know and in the college like out of the 120 130 students you hardly have two three dalit students so now what happens is these people hang out with themselves these people speak with themselves they have their own festivals they have their own family culture which they know i don't know anything about it right mm. so ultimately you are not going to be part of the circles so now now the thing is and on the boards on the notice boards everybody knows who, who is which caste through the categories you know general uh, you know sc st like that so everybody knows you are a dalit mm-hmm. okay and so the interaction is not that deep the bonding is not that deep okay then you go to jnu and jnu is a very interesting space because jnu you know you have like activism people everybody claim to understand caste everybody is very conscious and sensitive and all that but it's not true Uh, there is caste discrimination in interviews there is caste discrimination in viva uh, then uh, of course it's a liberal space so people can hang out with anybody they want but there are also issues of caste you know because people also want to hang out with their kind of people you know it's like birds flock together you know dogs flock together you know sheep flock together so it's like i am i am a nair from kerala hmm. and there is a uh, there is a khanna from punjab okay even if there is linguistic difference cultural difference but because we studied in same similar kind of schools because we watched the same kind of movies because we did some similar things so this is what i call cosmopolitan caste elites mm-hmm. so what is cosmopolitan caste elites even if you come from different place you grew up watching the same music same movies okay mm-hmm. so now when you come to jnu and then you meet for the first time and then you're like wow oh you listen to him oh i also listen to with him oh you like that food oh i also like that food oh you have read that book i also have read that so let's become friends mm-hmm. okay and people will say this is not caste but this is caste right you know based on what did you watch these movies the people are not watching these movies we grew up watching listening to kumar sanu okay mm-hmm. now then there is a middle class traditional caste traditional caste elites they are basically vernacular you know the bhumihars from uh, bihar hmm. you know or some rajput from rajasthan will come and you are you are in a class with all of them okay and the rajput is also showing some pride the bhumi are also showing some pride you know there is janmashtami is happening and these are vernacular elites they are speaking hindi you know they want to go and you know break that matka hmm. they are very proud okay so they also become friends they become friends based on pride the cosmopolitan caste elites become friends based on tastes mm-hmm. and there is a difference you know so what people will do is people will try to say that the vernacular caste elites coming from rajasthan and bihar are casteist mm-hmm. but this cosmopolitan english speaking swaf people are not casteist but for me both of them are casteist right now then coming to oxford you know oxford is like a, it's a very liberal space and here caste is no longer spoken everybody will tell oh i am from delhi i studied in sanskrit school oh i studied in saint stephens oh did you go to that cafe in khan market oh did you go to jaipur literary festival oh you know 
my cousin went to this school oh did you apply for this scholarship so then they will hang out again together they will celebrate diwali they will celebrate you know um they will celebrate diwali they will celebrate holi they will say oh this is our indian culture mm-hmm. this is how fun and nice and beautiful it is and then all the african students and european students were like wow such a beautiful culture you have such a nice colorful culture and they get excited and that's your caste is erased okay in all of this in the end you realize why is my experience not spoken about where is my culture where is my festival where is my history so there is a cognitive dissonance people go through conflict <laughs> you know so that is that is also my journey but i was confident enough because i was part of jnu as part of bapsa i was politically aware mm. so i was like i have my history i have my culture i'll celebrate it yeah you know it doesn't matter whether you accept it or not i'm going to talk about it so yeah that's basically the journey yeah basically. and of course i think the last thing i would add is about the idea of merit i mean when i went to oxford i really felt that i have to prove myself i have to do really well in my studies so that yeah. you know people don't question that oh this dalit guy got into oxford but what is he doing mm-hmm. so i read a lot um, i it was a lot of pressure but i read a lot i spent a lot of time mm-hmm. in, in you know improving my uh, academic credentials mm-hmm. so yeah basically there are yeah, there are so many methods tools that you have utilized to cope up and also you know that to prove that you are not less meritorious than them and also that you have talk about how the common interest become the you know that point of uh, interaction between the different uh, upper caste people from the different uh, geographical area and g- different culture so also you have envels uh, about this you know the caste network that perpetuate inequality in education and also in you know different uh, space so can you share specific example from your life or research that illustrate this that how uh, this network caste networks yes see if you look at like you know um, there are many studies about how caste and capitalism works in india you know uh people whose great grandparents had business in the 18th 19th century mm-hmm. is their great great grandchildren are also having the same kind of business you know you can pick out families in india uh, and few castes in india like haris damodaran is one example you know he's a, he has done these studies of how there are few of this caste communities who who have done business mm-hmm. for generations okay and their children are doing now flipkart and mintra it's the agarwals and guptas who are doing flipkart and mintras yes. okay their great grandparents she also used to do trade right now the thing is uh, brahmins used to earlier what do what do they do brahmins were basically clerks with the british officers you know doing this censors and other kind of service what are brahmin trade brahmins are now subaltern study scholar brahmins are south asian study scholar area studies mm-hmm. okay so they were doing the thing of the mind back then now also they are doing the same thing right they sit and think and write okay they they never into the physical labor who are doing physical labor mostly the dalit bojans in this country the adivasis in this country and uh, unlike earlier times you know there was never a time in india where only you know uh, caste people only did specific caste occupations you know like for example not all the manual scav- people from all the manual scavenging not all the people from manual scavenging caste will only do manual scavenging mm-hmm. not all the chamar people will do leather work not all the yadavs will you know you know take milk you know rare milk or cows they don't do that right they also people who did agriculture laborers you know agriculture labor there are people who did other kind of harsh work so now with the change of economy what has happened is most of the harsh jobs hmm. you know low paying jobs insecure jobs are being done by dalits you know a big section of obcs and adivasis who where are they mostly from in india bihar hmm. odisha jharkhand uttar pradesh west bengal you will find a lot of lower caste muslim from west bengal working in construction work bd factories a textile industry in tamil nadu gujarat you will find a lot of dalits and ebcs you know extremely backward caste people hmm. you know working in all this you know the, all these places in maharashtra in tamil nadu in andhra pradesh in gujarat Okay, because they don't have land 
you know they don't have any source of any other source of income they don't have traditional business you know so that's how caste works even today so these are my studies then you, you take the example of culture hmm. who are the ones who are producing all this netflix tv series who are the ones producing movies distributing it mostly banyas you know who are the ones who are part of uh, the uh, classical music scene in india brahmins tamil brahmins you know bengali brahmins bengali brahmins will do rabindra sangeet tamil brahmins will do carnatic music you know in between that there is one or two caste like nayars who claim that they were sudras maybe they don't claim they are sudras apparently they were sudras nobody knows some 4 500 years back but they also will uh, try to imitate the upper caste you know they like wow we are also we also they also have caste pride mm-hmm. right so that is the broad reality of india you take culture you take business you take media you take education you take property ownership land land is owned by mostly agrarian castes you know marathas jats mm. you know so everything has a place and then there are dalits and what do dalits have reservation <laughs> okay which will hardly give employment to less than 2 3% of people out of the 200 220 30 millions of dalits 1 to 3% of dalits will get that reservation and that is what we fight for every 2 3 years we'll do protest give us reservation okay land you cannot get because the moment you start protesting these people will do violence against you right you don't have any judges in the supreme court or high court who will fight for you there is no legal system which will support you you go and file a case in the village of caste atrocities there will be local caste associations or political parties who will come and influence it you cannot get justice so this is the reality we have to accept <laughs> whether it's 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 very tragic it's very sad but that is how it works and that is what i studied you know i read a lot of articles read a lot of books and i came to this understanding which of course is has been a part of anti caste movement for a very long time yeah that's true but yeah like many people argue that this mostly the upper caste liberal people that uh, this free economy and then free market uh, you know the after liberalization and globalization has you know that somehow helped dalits to you know the gate uh, better opportunity in their life and so on so do you think that uh, did it help or not no i mean see free economy as in okay let's say earlier dalit people used to do you know all the dirty jobs in a village now they come to city and they work in some factory from mm-hmm. morning 9 o'clock to you know night 10 o'clock you know they will work for hours and hours with very little pay mm-hmm. right so earlier in the village somebody will call you abe chamar chuda like that they will call you insult you now in the factory nobody might call you chamar or chuda but you have to work that only no you have to work hard only for little payment mm-hmm. so what is free economy doing you know how many dalits are um, you know um, how many dalits in india have big podcast and earning like big revenues how many dalits in india have startups okay mm-hmm. and earning big money how many adivasis are earning big money nobody Um, i we, i cannot even count maybe a few here and there okay would have but that is very rare so it has not helped even the free economy that we say has mostly been benefited by the upper castes in india you know they know how to monetize everything they i know upper caste girls who can just do makeup on instagram and youtube and they are celebrities they earn a big amount of money True. that is what the world is yeah so basically this free economy and the whatever the free market has you know that shifted this uh, institutionalized slavery into something else and then dalits who were earlier you know that slaves of the land owners and so on now they become the uh, slaves of the you know capitalist uh, industrialist and so on so yeah so yes definitely more or less same but the maybe the location has changed just the rural to you know the city and so that's why you know that yeah. few people now have started uh, you know that asserting and also you know that challenging uh, the already set up norms about the reservation and so on uh, affirmative policies that they are demanding uh, reservation in the private sector 
so because of the situation uh, this free market has created this capitalist uh, you know the market has created which is so unequal and also inhuman in nature that uh, their living condition is you know they're hard uh, very hard to imagine even for the others uh, like particularly for the dalit so yeah uh, and also like uh, moving on to the another topic that you have you know that uh, touch upon on uh, in your memoir and also you have uh, occasionally talk about it on your social media platform that uh, the idea of identity and particularly your identity and so your narrative explore the complex dynamics of the conversion to christianity and also the oppression faced by dalits within the hindu and christian communities so is there a common thread in the op in this operation across religion religious lines and how do you see that uh, i i want to add another question um, to this that how do you want to uh, see this uh, entire debate surrounding uh, this reservation to the dalit christian and so on so yeah well see like again i'll tell you honestly so what has happened in india is like you know we need to also understand geographically right uh, places like tamil nadu andhra pradesh kerala um karnataka you know these are places which have which ha which has seen a lot of dalits convert to christianity because many missionaries came and worked in these places yeah right many missionaries came and worked in these places since 17th 18th centuries okay tamil tamil nadu you have a lot of portuguese missionaries who came and worked later many uh, protestant missionaries who came and worked okay now these missionaries helped some missionaries uh, were caste conscious some missionaries were not okay so some missionaries were some mission societies were caste conscious they helped the dalit converts okay in giving them little bit of education you know giving them health care and where an upper caste people are not even touching you these missionaries are, missionaries are coming and you know giving you some education giving you some health care and they are also telling you that there is a god who loves you there is a god who wants to touch you mm. you know so all of these things so over a period of time dalits a section of dalits benefited out of missionary education or you know the health care all of that which and they found a new identity mm. which was a free identity it was a not enslaved identity you know in the christian world view there is no caste you know there is no caste mentioned in the christian world view so they are part of that world view now okay they they believe that we are created by god we are valuable mm. okay and one day we are going to go to heaven because there is a god who came to came to this earth and he died for our sins and he loved us jesus loved us and so one day we are going to be with him so this is the belief basically okay now what happened is even if you convert there are also upper caste people who have converted and they still go back to their own culture you know their past culture like okay we have this culture our family legacy all of that and they start to also discriminate but the thing within christianity is you won't see uh, i mean among indian christians is you won't see caste violence among indian christians very strongly like how you see among hindus uh, so these people will not marry with you many of these upper caste christians will not marry dalit christians okay and they might not give you institutional space like education institutions hospitals they might not employ you properly but they will not do these extreme forms of physical violence extreme forms of caste atrocities extreme forms of untouchability they will not do which is a difference right now when it comes to dalit christians on one hand they are christians but also they are dalits right and in the larger scheme of question of nationalism okay hindu religion you know christianity is a threat or islam is a threat these are things that have been built up over a period of time last 30 40 years right and in that what happens is many times even dalits who are hindus okay will go against dalit christians okay and this is this is happening even among adivasis adivasis who uh, practice sarna will go against adivasis who are christians because the rss is telling that look these people are these people are getting foreign funding these people are advancing these people are eating beef these people are you know have some hidden id agenda mm -hmm. all that is there but if you look at material question if i were to talk about orissa where i come from mm -hmm. materially there is not much difference you know the outside upper caste people don't see you as like whether you've converted or not converted they look at you as like you're a dalit mm -hmm. okay 
we face the same discrimination, you know, like we live in the same colony nearby. Okay, the only difference is on Sunday I go to church. Okay, I end on some other day I go for some prayer meeting or something like that. Apart from that, there is not much difference. My worldview is different, maybe, of how I see myself, how I value myself, where I will go after death, life. These are very spiritual questions, which you might not agree with me. I mean, the Dalit Hindus might not agree with me, but apart from that, everything else is the same. And the reservations is supposed to be given by uh, caste disabilities, you know. Are you facing caste disabilities? Are you facing untouchability of certain kinds? Mm. You know? Uh, so, which, yes, there is. And that's why I claim that Dalit Christians should be given SC status. You know? Because if you go by the, you know, census 1911 or 1901, the um, criteria for caste, for scheduled caste list, okay? No, most of the scheduled caste people will not fit into it today because it's a very strange, stupid idea. You know, is the Brahmin eating food from your plate? Are you allowed to go to temples? So there are many Dalit Hindus today who are allowed to go to temples. So does that mean they should not be given SC status? No, right? What was SC status? You know, it was for us to have proper representation, mm -hmm. you know, and get an education and get employment. And protest. It's about that. Mm -hmm. And within Ambedkar mm -hmm. movement also, people are not understanding that if we make the SC status religious neutral, then what will happen is, the number of SCs also will increase in a big number. Mm. Okay. An SC status will no longer be Hindu. You can practice whichever small, small native religion you want. Mm. So what does that mean? You know, around 25 to 30% of a population is not bound under the Hindu category. Definitely. They can be any religion they want to. Right. So that is what I, that is what my argument is. That is what, uh, you know, that is what I stand for because I've seen Dalit Christians in Orissa and their life, their material conditions, right? The other thing it will do is also, you know, uh, it will also break the larger monolith of Hindu identity. There's nothing called larger Hindu identity. Everything is clubbed under Hindu. You practice, you go and worship a stone, that is also Hinduism. You practice Ram, that is also Hinduism, you know? And in the name of Hinduism, all the Brahmins and Vanyas are enjoying their life, doing politics, and BJP is doing that. You know. So, and the, the thing is, there is a huge population, like, you know, there is a good no, good amount, good number of Christians in South India. Okay. And I don't know how uh, Ambedkarite leaders from UP and, you know, intellectuals from Maharashtra are thinking that we can do Ambedkarite movement without Dalit Christians. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people who have contributed to the Dalit movement are Dalit Christians. You know, musicians, intellectuals, writers from Telangana, Andhra, from Tamil Nadu. Yeah. How are you going to do a movement without your own people? You know, already there is so much of division. On top of that, you're saying we want another division. Yeah. yeah. Whatever you have to worship inside your house is inside your house. Why do you have to bring it to movement? Right. In the moment we are coming together because we are Dalits, because we are facing this discrimination. Mm -hmm. And nobody is saying that give reservation out of that 17 or 18, you know, 15 percent. No, we are saying expand the reservation mm -hmm. according to population, our population, according to Dalit population. And then that's what we're demanding. Yeah, yeah. That's... So, yes. Yeah. Uh, although we don't have much time, but I wanted to discuss about this. Uh the idea of like that you have a crisis of you know that grammar in your memoir that uh, how the dalit community yes. with the dalit community there are like you know so many contradictions that you have rightly how highlighted that why they don't want to include dalit christian dalit you know that muslim and so on uh, so you call it uh, a crisis of grammar so how do you define it Um, so crisis of grammar is like, so what I was trying to do is what a crisis, a crisis of grammar is like, um, is mostly vocabularies, you know, like how, how do we understand categories like Dalit or categories like Bahujan or category like, categories like Ambedkar politics. When we hear these ideas, you know, when we, when we hear the word Dalit, when we hear the word Bahujan or when we, when we hear the word Ambedkar, what comes to our mind, you know, is defined by 
only a small section of people who come from Maharashtra and UP. You know, culturally it is defined by people from Maharashtra and politically it is defined by UP. You know, they believe that this is how the elite should be from everywhere. Okay, this is the path they should follow. Mm. Right? And I don't agree to it. You know, I don't agree to it because we have like 200, more than 200 million Dalits. Okay. And there is a vast, diverse history, rich history we have. Yes. You know, uh, and so not everybody will agree to it. So what is, what, what are we supposed to do is we're supposed to be more diverse. We're supposed to be more engaging. Inclusive. Yeah. We're supposed to be more in solidarities without asking everybody to conform to what we believe is the way. Yes. You know, and that's why I said like, yes, um, if Buddhism worked in Maharashtra, it's great. But, but you cannot tell the Dalit Christians in Andhra and Telangana who've been Dalit Christians for the last 200, 300 years to tell them that only if you convert to Buddhism, we will do it. We will do the Dalit movement. It doesn't work like that. right? Or let's say UP people saying that only electoral politics is the way. Yes. You know, what are you supposed to do in places where Dalit population is very less? Mm -hmm. You know, what are you supposed to do? Like, will you win elections? I'm telling you, in Maharashtra, Dalits on their own will not win elections because the percentage is so less. Yes, that's true. You know? So, my only thing is, there is no one way. Mm. There are multiple ways to work for our community. You know, Paranjit is doing it through films. Arivu is, do, is doing it with music. Anup sir is doing it with education. Okay, RS Pravin sir is doing it with education. Okay, there are some people who are doing it through art. There is Jinima who is singing. Okay, so we need everything together for the anti caste movement to go forward, and one way is not the way. Yes, that's true. That we in front of us, we have a very bigger, you know, that cause which is to eradicate caste system, and for that, we require a lot of many things to be, you know, come together and then work as a as a unified force. Yeah, and then only we can win this, uh, you know, that giant of car system so yeah to ending this discussion i just wanted to ask you the last question about your how uh, what are the exciting projects that you are currently working on is there any book that you are currently writing any any uh rap that you are you know that uh, filming any documentary something that you we can anticipate from you in near future uh, so basically what doing is you know um now i'm really like you know i'm editing a book this and this 15 to 16 essays will be on different community different castes you know from brahmins in kolkata to thakurs in up to marathas in maharashtra uh, so i'm compiling 15 essays by 15 young research scholars um on different castes hmm. and i'm going to make i'm going to edit a book Okay, that's one of the projects that I'm working on. The other project is I'm mostly interested in, uh, you know, uh, I'm 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 writing some essays on different topics that comes to my mind, and I won't publish it as a book or something, but I'll make it, maybe make a newsletter or yeah. something. That's what I'm planning to do. And in the future, my in my real interest is to you know start like a small coaching academy in my district where I can, you know, maybe I can get people to teach English and computer and geography, history, like that, basics to class 12 students so that they can learn all of that and apply for any entrance exam they can. Um, yes, that is all basically, and I'm reading as much as I can. Yeah, that's great. And yes, I, I, I worked with two, three documentaries with French Radio, Radio Life. Um, so that is going to be screened in the US in Princeton, and in Los Angeles in September. So I'll be going there. Wow, that's great. And when we can, you know, this, see, you know, watch that, all those documentary? Will it go? I think by June or July, they're going to re release it. Okay. Okay. So, all right, then. That was a, indeed a truly inspiring conversation, Sumit. And uh, your journey and work are truly enriching. And I believe that many in the audience also you know that found your insights more valuable uh, thank you for sharing your story and your ex expertise with us and very all the best for your thank you future projects thank you Niraj. thank you so much and all the best for all that you're doing thank you so much mm -hmm.